stable. We are green light go. You can go start using it as long as your system is supported. Um, we have some, we've been doing a lot of work testing various packages and systems and working with mo um, system and module developers in order to get things up to date. And oh, as of right now, like over 75% of worlds are ready to, for 08. So, it's, you know, you can start checking into your modules as well. Um, we have a, you know, spreadsheet that Nath and a bunch of community testers have been working on. Um, but it was quite the hectic, you know, few weeks. It was like a we we did like 084, then 085, then 086, week after week after week. We closed something like seven to ten issues a day, and that's not taking any days off. If like if you count that, you know, we didn't work every single day. Uh, you know, it's even higher than that. Um, Nath, how how did you survive the a lot a big launch? Uh, well, I'm alive. Um, no, it, it was it was good. It's not the first time that I've had to deal with like a, a high period of production. So in previous jobs, I I would just you you knuckle down and you do what needs to be done for the period. In this job, it was actually a lot more relaxed. Um, even even though we weren't taking any days off, we were really all of us. The whole team was putting in sometimes incredible hours. I know uh, I know Matt was putting in like by my estimate, at least 18 hour days, some days, uh, working on the, uh, production for the, the anniversary video. Um, and we just kind of, we just, we do it because we love it, not because we're asked to, uh, I mean, Atropos himself, Andrew didn't, didn't look at us and say, okay, so we're doing anniversary week. You're all expected to work, you know, 20 hour days. And if you're not putting in the time, then you're fired. It was, I'm going to be working on this project. It's the anniversary week. So I'm going to be putting in some extra hours. You guys are welcome to join me if you'd like. And we all did because that, you know, we love, we love this job. If you haven't seen the wonderful anniversary video that Matt slaved away at, um, the, I just posted it in Twitch chat. It is a great overview of Foundry and what's in it. Um, it's great for newcomers, but it's also great for, you know, if you are catch up what Foundry's done in the past year or so. Um, yeah, but no, it was great working together. It was a lot of good hard work and it was nice to take a breather, you know, in this past week after, you know, the release got out. Uh, but, you know, uh, ever forward and onward for sure and to be honest one of the one of the favorite things that i did over that uh one week period was absolutely working with the various helpers and moderators that have contributed to the uh the module testing for 086 so that we could get kind of word out in the community you mentioned it briefly the spreadsheet is out there and I, I actually did an update pass on it this morning and we are now uh, firmly in the camp of more modules and systems supporting 086 than those that are not. So I'm, uh, I'm very comfortable with that. Uh, we're going to be talking in a little bit with JDW, who's the, the mind behind, uh, well, the driving force behind Dice So Nice, but also who launched, you know, the Rollsmith package. But we also have some other module stuff going on in the community, don't we? We sure do. Um, the League of Extraordinary Foundry Virtual Tabletop Developers, of which I'm getting better at saying that name the lot more I say it on stream, uh, is currently running a package jam. It started with Foundry's anniversary and is ending with the League's anniversary, um, which means you have over a month to get entries in still. Uh, it's only just started warming up. Um, it's a bit more professionally done this year as we've grown in, you know, from a couple hundred people to over 2,000 in the league. Um, not all of them developers, of course, but, you know, the content creators, people watching, listening in on modules, you know, system development teams and such uh, are all starting to, co you know, collect in there to work together. Um, we already have 10 package jam entries, which is pretty impressive, especially since six of them all came from one author. The Ripper 93 has submitted six packages. 
uh, since we, uh, since we've opened it up just a week or two ago. Um, some of these packages are really cool too. It's doing things like replacing old modules from like 05, 06 that haven't gotten updates like Patrol. Um, he's written new versions of that. Uh, he has, you know, his own take on multi-level tokens. Uh, he has, you know, uh, his own easy targeting module. Like he is building a bunch of, he's looking at older modules and rebuilding uh, some of their concept into 08, which is really cool. That is uh, awesome to hear. I know I know there's a lot of packages that, you know, e even during the last package jam, we had a bunch of people release modules and then just kind of disappear from the development community. And I mean, that's, it's totally acceptable. I mean, if I put out a module, I, I'm one of them. Uh, if I put out a module and no longer want to update it, that's that's my prerogative. Does the league do anything about, you know, helping to maintain packages that have been abandoned? Uh, we do. It was actually one of the initiatives that we, one of the very first things that we realized that we could be more than just p developers talking about development and, you know, start taking on, you know, being a, more of a community. Um, back in 07, a lot of modules didn't survive and, you know, authors gave them up or disappeared or things like that. Personal life came up. So we started a program where you could, you know, willingly, you know, give up a module or, you know, we would, you know, note, note modules that hadn't, you know, their authors hadn't been online for, you know, six months or more or things like that. And these abandoned or endangered modules, you know, we would go, we would collect information on them. We try to reach out to the author. Um, and in cases where, we, you know, they were gone, we would, you know, put them up for adoption, try to match them to new maintainers and work with Foundry in order to get them under new maintenance. As part of that, they stay under a GitHub reorg that we have, you know, our member leadership in so that if those people ever disappear, it's easy enough to just go ahead and trade them out. That That's less of an issue now in 08 because 08, so, you know, as long as we give over ownership of, you know, the admin page to someone new, 08 will prop someone and say, hey, look, um, you know, 1001 fish at Cease and Drasky is out of date, but now you can have a new one at, you know, slash JDW. Uh, so that's, you know, helped that initiative as well. Um, but yeah, no, there's been quite a number of, you know, things that have been willingly given up because authors are just, you know, they realize they're too busy that life's gotten them, you know, too too busy to keep up to date so they just find you know we help match them with someone to work on them sure and of course foundry as staff you know we we go out of our way if someone emails us you know hey so this package hasn't been updated in six months it's owned by someone else but i've forked their repository and under their license i'm able to you know pick it up and start maintaining it can you give me ownership of it on the website? And we work with the developer to try and communicate with the original author and see if we can resolve that. Uh, so, I mean, between between us and the league, there's there's a steady effort to maintain even the older modules that don't see a lot of use or haven't been updated in a very long time. Um. The first pack of jam sauce crossed 500 modules, and now as the second one warms up, we are nearly at 900 modules. And I'm sure we'll probably cross that 1,000 with this package jam, uh, based on last year's. Now, if you're one of the people, you know, all of us tr spread the job of reviewing modules as they come in, um, but you are, you know, first and foremost there and looking at licensing, making sure things are copyright friendly and things like that. You want to tell us what it looks like when we start getting these slam slew of uh, entries? Yeah, so we, on an average week, we'll see maybe, maybe seven, maybe ten modules submitted uh, or systems or other packages, uh, just, just in an average week during package jam time sometimes we see that number in a day um so of course it puts a bit a little bit more strain on us to make sure that we're getting them reviewed properly and that we're checking them for you know appropriate content and of course always the big question is copyright because too often people don't think about whether or not they are allowed to use many of the images or uh text that they want to use in their systems modules etc and that you know we want to protect people from themselves and the potential that they might open a lawsuit or god knows what else getting a cease and desist is not good for anybody 
Uh, so it's it's usually our approach to have a quick look through any any package that's submitted, check for images that might not have come from, you know, uh, Creative Commons sources, that kind of thing. Make sure that the author submitting the package actually has the rights to use the content that they're submitting. And it's frustrating and disappointing for everyone. I mean, copyright copyright can stand in the way of having a really good module released. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we're respecting content creators and, and the original publisher of whatever might be submitted. So it is very important to us to, to make sure that we're not only protecting the developer, but also the original content creator's rights. Um, so we, we review packages for that purpose. And I'm not going to say that we haven't had some that have slipped through, because obviously that can happen. But uh, we do our absolute utmost to try and protect rights of creators and the rights of the developer. Um, before we bring on our guests, do you have any recommendations to those about to submit some packages that would make the process easier and quicker for us to review? For sure. Um, make sure that any description that you're submitting actually includes uh, the details of what the module actually contains. If you have any artwork that, uh, that you're submitting as part of the module, take the time to source where the rights for those pieces of art are coming from. Uh, often there's a, often there's a variety of websites, any art that actually has its license associated with it on its website, definitely make sure that you include it in just a little like uh, sources.md file in your repository or what have you, just something so that when we look, we can go, oh yeah, so they're using like a bunch of assets from this game assets pack. Totally fine though, I see they've got the license here. Um, yeah, I know just, from it, my side, if I see something that has any art, I immediately stop reviewing the module pretty much and say, all right, this is for Nath. And so if you can get those things listed, it enables us to, the rest of us to maybe get through it a little faster. Also including screenshots and you know, of what the module looks like when it's activated. Um, if it's for developers like a library, make sure you put big bold text saying that it's only for developers and doesn't provide any functionality directly to a user. Um, you know, all these things help in getting it reviewed quickly and approved quickly. In addition, we've got a, a real quick kind of FAQ uh, recommendations for submitting modules that might contain licensed content and you can actually check it out. I'll post the URL in chat. It's uh, it's a very useful page for any content creators out there or module creators out there who want to submit something that could contain copyrighted information. Um, we're obviously none of us on staff are lawyers and it would be very expensive to retain a lawyer solely for the purposes of going over all of these submitted pieces. Uh, so all of this advice is provided solely on a, we're trying to help you, but if you get into legal hot water, you're on your own kind of thing. Uh, you know, we, we all try and do the best we can. So I think we'll be joined by uh, JDW here in just a moment. Uh, before we do, uh, Cody, what's your, uh, what's your favorite thing? about uh, about 086. What's the favorite feature that got added that you enjoy? 086 in particular or 08 and as a whole? 08 as a whole. And while you're discussing that, we can bring JDW on. Matt can work in the background. Sounds good. Uh, I mean, as someone working on the development itself, the documents refactor, which I know caused, you know, that was a big change for, uh, you know, all systems and modules using uh, entities to swap to documents. But as someone working in their day to day, it really has solidified the patterns of how to access everything and made our jobs easier, made my job of, you know, speed ramping up and starting to work on core a lot easier. Um, and so it's, any, you know, we had to go back and briefly work on 0710 and such. And it's just like, oh, yeah, no, I, I like documents. Documents are good. 
Uh, from a GM perspective, I, I, the audio changes are actually a huge win for me. I have so much finer grain control over what's playing and what volume and how to mix them and things like that. And I, I love it. Nice, nice. So JDW, welcome to the stream. Uh, Hello. Everyone, everyone out there can uh, can also join me in giving JDW a nice big <laughs> welcome. Uh, Hello, everyone. And uh, I understand that you're not only the driving force behind Dice So Nice, one of the most popular modules for Foundry VTT. You're also behind Foundry Hub and most recently the Rollsmith uh, website for buying additional textures for Dice So Nice. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, just let me just uh, thank you for having me uh, tonight. And to start things off, uh, I will just say first that Dice So Nice was not created by myself. It was created by someone called Simon, who's also a uh, uh, developer for other modules like um, Babel that uh, help to translate compendiums and other cool modules. Uh, so I didn't create it and then I just want that to be clear because sometimes there is a bit of a confusion confusion because I've been maintaining the module for the last year. But yeah, uh, just wanted to preface this. Gotcha, gotcha. For sure. And uh, so before, you know, making waves as a Foundry developer, what credentials do you have like what what led you into this what's your what's your background oh um well i've been working in the video game industry for the last 10 years uh, in a small studio uh, in france we do games for mobile and browser games um and so i've been extensively using the web technologies uh all these years so as also a player of uh uh, TTRPG, obviously, when I discovered Foundry, it was like a, a dream come true. Um, I could uh, just merge all my hobbies and passion into one thing, so, yeah. Nice. Um, so, you mentioned, you know, it was a dream come true when you first found Foundry. How, how did you find it? Um, so, I'm... Um, I'm only playing right now um, Warhammer, um, Warhammer uh, Fantasy. And uh, so I discovered Foundry thanks to Mooman, the developer behind the uh, Warhammer um, system. And it was incredible to see the kind of automation and um, things you could do in, uh, in the virtual tabletop when I discovered um, Foundry. Uh, I think the system was probably at the time one of the most advanced. I think it still is, but at the time it was even uh, more impressive uh, to see what he was able to do with uh, with Foundry. Uh, so it all started with uh, with this game, and uh, I first played it. Then I wanted to change things in the system, so I talked to Mooman and I started to see if everything works did some um, features for the systems um, and well, everything else is history, I guess. Um, I know when you f first started working on Dice So Nice, you know, Simon had adapted Teal Dice uh, online 3D Dice Roller to Foundry. Um, since then, you've reworked a lot of the performance, making dice rolls a lot faster. Uh, you've yeah. also had a lot of customization options, like the ability to change, you know, the the text and the you know uh, textures and colors and such. Um, one of the first interactions I ever had with you was working together to get like a custom, you know, image for the twenty on a D twenty. You want to tell us about some of the other things you've like added to Dice on Ice over the year? Yeah, sure. So when I first started working on Dice on Ice uh, one year ago, um, it was still. Uh, 1.0 uh, version of the module. Uh, you could only have one color, I believe, for every dice, the textures. So I was interested in expanding the uh, possibilities. I, um, by accident, I found uh, an online dice roller that was using the same technology used by Dice on Ice, so the Tilk Fork, uh, created by someone that is now uh, a member of our community. Uh, Major Victory, who's done some incredible work on uh, uh, 
uh, taming the um, creating things to tempt your your uh, your, your foundry uh, and he had work on something that was really similar so I contacted him and see, see if I could um, use his code as a starter and from there I've been uh, expanding the Dyson Ice module, rewriting nearly everything um, from the ground uh, to improve the performance a lot, add a lot of uh, new um, lighting system to have more um, uh, realistic dice, you could say. I've added like um, special effects. Uh, I've reworked, uh, yeah. <laughs> Probably about everything that was in 1.0, but um, credit where credit is due. Um, there's two people, Simon and um, and Major Victory, uh, helped helped me a lot to to get there. Uh, and uh, now there's a go ahead. Uh, sorry, I was just going to ask that with relation to you, you talked about updating and rewriting, and I know uh, Dice So Nice is based on, I think, 3JS, right? Yes, uh, 3D Engine is uh, 3JS. Right, Engine. and um, basically with, with this update, of course, and, and 08 in the last month, what was it like updating your modules for 08X? Uh... <laughs> well, to be honest, it was breeze. I just waited for people to tell me that everything was okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> apparently, it was. So yeah, I I just had some stuff um, related to audio uh, because uh, there is a um, sound effect when the dice collides and things like that. But it was an easy fix. I did not had to do anything related to the new document. Um, specification or anything like that so very easy what about uh, async dice sorry what did about I... async dice how did that impact you um i have not yet had the chance to um, play with it um i guess i'm waiting for um a module that that use it that can um take advantage of it to uh, be compatible with async, but I think it will not be a big issue. One thing that I would like to be able in Dyson Dice, thanks to the new functionality in 08, is to have a, an alternative mod to play with the dice, uh, more like um, in the Veltop Simulator or something like that, like where you can pick up the dice and throw them on the table. Um, I, I mean, it, it probably won't be um, used by everyone uh i think it's a bit special but um i've get i've got a lot of um requests for a mod like this and it was not possible until uh open eight that's uh yeah I, I vaguely recall that when we were scoping the issues for 08 i think 08 one uh there was discussion of uh, surrounding asynchronous dice and the possibility of uh dice and nice allowing you to pick up and throw dice around to get your results. So I'm, I'm very curious and interested to see where that ends up going. Even though I'm not much of a dice player, I'm more of a card player. Well, um, cards are nice, anyone? I don't know. <laughs> Coming soon or not? I don't know. <laughs> Why are we not funding this? We need to be funding this. Can we fund this? <laughs> Cody, can we fund? Can we get that? Yeah, right? I'll check my yes. wallet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so since you know you've you've developed a lot of dice sets and colorization and customization for dice so nice of course that naturally led to the creation of the rollsmith which is really just the thing for dice goblins everywhere <laughs> So can you tell us a little bit about, you know, uh, what exactly does the process of creating a new dice set for Rollsmith look like for you? Like, what programs do you use? Uh, how do you make it happen? Yeah, sure. Uh, so for an, anyone that doesn't know what Rollsmith is, it's um, a shop um, I created with a friend of mine, a 3D artist called Navy. 
and uh, we sell uh, custom models for Dyson Ice. So uh, we try to be um, to go where uh, the possibilities of Dyson Ice can't uh, bring you. So we do things that are not possible uh, right now in Dyson Ice without a 3D artist working in the background. Um, and so because of that, we use a lot of 3D software to do things like we create materials um, in a software called Substance that lets you um, merge multiple materials that you could find in real life and tweak the colors and tweak how they reflect light and uh, how they, if they are in metal or if they are in plastics and a lot of things like that. So we, we first create the, uh, the, uh, the material of the dice, you could say, uh, but it's all in 2D. Um, and then we create uh, 3D models in Blender. Um, so it can be a very simple um, dice like you are used to see, or we can be, uh, we have a lot more uh, possibilities because it's in 3D and not in real life. So we we have no issue compared to uh, real uh, dice, like are the dice um, fair? Are they rolling always on the same probabilities or things like that? So we can, uh, we can be very free here. Um, so we can, we can create a 3D models like with all inside or with, uh, uh, yeah, anything that you think of, um, probably more. And then uh, we bring it into Dyson Ice thanks to the API that is available by, by uh, anyone. Huh? Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing things that are not um, possible for anyone else. I just want to 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 focus on this. Uh, I am not trying to reduce the possibilities uh, of Dyson Ice. Dyson Ice is a open source project uh, that I care a lot about, and um, Rollsmith is just a way to do things that I am not able to do with Dyson Ice, uh, at least not right now. So right now, a standard Dyson Ice user can go into Foundry and customize their dice. They can take a standard D20 and other dice and give it a either color or texture um, and, you know, different text sizes and fonts and such. Do you want to help clarify, like, what you're doing that's different and how it's cooler? Yeah, um, so the big difference is related to the model we use. Um, Dyson Ice to be able to customize your, your dice. Uh, we use a very simple model. Uh, if you um, check the model that we have in Dyson Ice, it's very sharp. The edge are very sharp. There is no, um, no complex uh, 3D uh, stuff going there. And um, to be able to change things on the fly directly in the software, we generate what each face can look like um, apart from each other. So the face are not connected uh, until we render them in Dyson Ice. So that means that, for example, you could not do in Dyson Ice without creating a custom model. Uh, you could not have, let's say, um, uh, a, a shape or um, uh, a pattern that covers multiple faces like just imagine uh, a red line going all over the dice without interruptions that would not be possible in dice on ice uh, for this reason so yeah um, and obviously the 3d models in itself uh, doing uh, crazy stuff in 3d uh, that can't be done in dice on ice uh, by users at least so yeah that's the two things that separate what uh, we can do in rollsmith and what dice on ice can offer to users yeah, as a system dev, I, you know, applied a red splotchy texture to my dice, but each triangle on the D20 had its own, so they didn't match up. Yes. You know, I'm, your textures look, they're just so much more seamless. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's really possible in, uh, th thanks to thanks to 3D softwares and uh, what we call UV, UV mapping that let you, like, project an image on a 3D form that I can't do that in Dyson Ice. Um, the math would be like so complicated to to make it work. 
Um, at least for now, but who knows, may maybe one day. So with the, uh, with the recent beginning of June, you guys launched the, uh, the Pride Week uh, dice set that, uh, sorry, Pride Month dice set that uh, is free for everyone to download. And we've actually uh, loaded up a, a, a pre ready to go scene where, uh, where Matt nice. can show off some of these, uh, some of the Rollsmith dice sets. So uh, why don't we just get a massive roll going, Matt, if you just want to throw down some dice and see what we end up with. Uh, the uh, of course with the screen share, you guys are gonna see you know all manner of just crazy vibrant rainbow dice, and I'm personally a big fan of this. As part of the LGBTQ community, it's it's great to see stuff come out with support, and you know people show their support for the community as well. So this being free for everyone to download, I'm I'm over the moon. For this. Thank you. This is great, and it's well, gorgeous it, it, how the colors just like merge across the faces and along the edges and such. Yeah, yeah, I love it too. Uh, and uh, there's a bit of uh, history here um, because when I released Python Ice 2.0, I've got a message from someone that was wanting to get um, this kind of dice in Dyson Ice. So. She made a um, long post on our GitLab with a lot of image and IDs. And I so wanted to be able to, to do that, but it was not possible because of the limitation that I talked about. Um, so, yeah, I, when, when, uh, when we launched Rollsmith, I knew that was one of the first models that I wanted to, to do. And, uh, well, it uh, was not... Uh, uh, plan, but uh, the timing made it that it was Pride Month, so it was perfect mm -hmm. for for this uh, for these models. And Matt just showed off what are now my new favorite dice, the honeycomb dice with the little <laughs> hexes on it. It, it. Each face has a different number of hexes. Are those hexes like actually different heights from the rest of the face and catch the light? Then it looked like they are. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is. It was. Uh, it was a funny thing to to create. Uh, one of the things that you can create with uh, the latest software that lets you customize and generate things through um, a lot of um, inputs, like create your your shape and the, the colors, and then you add a lot of noise. And well, you you can do so many things, and it's so interesting and also so complicated. I've learned so much in the last month, um, but yeah. Yeah, if you zoom on them, you can see that they are all unique. So um, jumping jumping back real quick to that honeycomb dice set, uh, after uh, after Matt rolls these uh, these really shiny, I'm going to say marble black dice, if we can get them to jump back to the honeycomb to show them off a little more, I've got some uh, I've got some questions about you know. Particularly, these look really complicated. Like, there's there's obviously a lot of work that went into this particular set. Um, are there more complex dice like this on the way, or do you have stuff in the pipeline where you're planning like oh. crazy wild dice <laughs> textures that do stuff like this? Yeah, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, yeah, yeah, we have a lot of things that we are working on right now. Um, the Pride um, dice were a bit of a side project uh, that I was able to to do. But Navy, my um, my friend, the free artist, working on the dice. Uh, she's working on some amazing um, sketches and uh, um, and three D rendering that I can show right now. But um, we are working right now on a lot of um, dice sets. Uh, related to uh, D&D. Um, we are trying to create dice that could appeal to any, um, uh, you know, like class of, of, uh, of uh, players or, or the GM. Um, we, we, we are trying to, yeah, to convey uh, a bit more than just colors. Uh, we are trying to 
create dice that can represent your your characters uh, when you roll them in the in foundry. So, yeah, should be well, should be fun. You already offer bundles of your dice. For example, you can buy the wooden bundle that gets all you gets you all the wooden dice, yeah. which was appreciated. You know, I, I love those. Before you released the honeycomb, I was running you know those wooden ones. Um, with how many dice you have, like, is that your plan? Or is there going to be a dice subscription? Like, I, I, I'm apparently a digital dice gremlin where I haven't been a physical one. So I, I, you're really hurting. You know, I need a, a cheaper entry to all of them. Um, so I'm not sure right now we decided against a subscri subscription model. Uh, like we do not have a Patreon right now. It's not that we do not like Patreon, but it's more that that, um, well, Patreon comes with a lot of, um, hidden, um, uh, needs that you, that you have to mm -hmm. follow, like, um, first, the first thing is that you have to be a bit regular in your, uh, uh, in what you release. And we didn't want to feel like it was becoming a burden to create dice just to appease um, our Patreons. Um, we felt like it could mean that we would do easier dice sets uh, instead of trying to go crazy and take all the time we need to do some really unique uh, new models. Um, so maybe one day when we are feeling a bit more um, uh, confident in our capacities to produce uh, a larger quantity, that's what we can do right now. Um, but right now we are we will keep on the uh, pay ones, uh, keep uh, always model because that's what brings the user, I think, the best value um, given our way of working. And you can buy gift cards for your GM to load into a world. Oh, yeah. Um, do you want to talk about what it looks like to buy and uh, acquire these models in a digital world? Yeah, um, so it's very simple. It's not available through the uh, Foundry module uh, browser. Um, you have to go to our website, that's herolsmith.com, or you can find them on the uh, Forge Marketplace too. Um, and from there, you just buy uh, your preferred die sets, and you'll get a unique link that lets you download it as much as you want. Um, and from a manifest URL, we have a guide uh, telling you everything when, when you buy uh, other dice, how to you activate them, how to install them. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just a module that you add to your Foundry, um, Foundry server, so very easy to, to set up. As a player, I can go and, you know, if I'm playing in a bunch of one shots, I can ask the GM or to load it into their world and pick it for myself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can do that thanks to Dice on Ice. Um, that's something that um, in, in not, in not, not a lot of uh, uh, people knows. Um, that's the Dice, Dice on Ice settings are saved um, in the database of your world. So a GM can log as another player and set up a special um, dice configuration for him. And uh, it will be available once the player uh, logs to his character. That's that's awesome. I was completely unaware of that fact. Yeah, um, I think it's something that uh, not, not a lot of modules are doing right now, but uh, more and more are picking uh, on that. It's very useful for, for GMs. Nice. I, and if um, you are a developer and you are would like to acquire more of these wonderful dice, um, Rollsmith has sponsored the Package Jam with over $120 of gift cards, uh, with the top prize being a $40 Rollsmith gift card um, for the top-ranked community module entry. Um, so you can go make something cool and get some cool dice in return. And even a, a custom D twenty for every uh, developer that participate in the in the jam. That that is really awesome. That's that's a lot of sponsorship and donation. And I think I, I just, just based on what I, said, I don't a lot want to. Sorry, I, I don't want to to um, take uh, from him. Uh, I think it's. Um, 
Ad ID Bureau that is sponsoring um, this part of the of the prizes. Uh, the Aerosmith is sponsoring the custom D20. I don't want him to to be erased from the, <laughs> from the from the conversation here. Uh, by the ID Bureaus is one of the um, League of Extraordinary Developers uh, Fire Jugglers, and uh, he sponsored himself from his pocket uh, this gift card. That's really cool. Yeah. So with with the Rollsmith dice sets, they're not currently customizable as I understand it. No. Yeah, that's uh, that's the other side of, uh, of, the, of the coin, right? Um, there is things that we can do thanks to um, Dyson Ice system that lets you customize your dice and things that are not possible, but it works both ways um, when you are using the Rollsmith dice or any custom 3D model that you could find um, in the future. Um, you can't customize them because, yeah, they are using something totally different. They are, you could, you could um, imagine them, imagine them as um, bundled. Um, everything is packed into a single file. Uh, the 3D models, the colors, uh, yeah, the text, the labels, everything. So you can't customize them. Right. So do you think there's a possibility in the future that that's something that would be possible or is it just it's part of it it's part of the cost of doing business for uh getting these really awesome looking models yeah so um yes and no uh i have a, a bit of a, a little uh ray of hope uh maybe um i don't think it would be in the near future possible to customize customize the, the dice themselves but what I'm working on uh, for free in the Dyson Ice uh, project, uh, and I can talk about because it's really near from completion. So uh, it's that I'm working on a system that lets you um, select a different appearance for each dice of your dice set. So for example, you could have your D20 with this type of color and your D6 with this other type of color. So technically, if you have multiple uh, variations of the Rollsmith dice could um, have multiple color uh, in your dice set from your multiple Rollsmith uh, modules or Dyson Ice integrated um, appearances. So yeah, the idea is, is to create um, the same thing that you could do in real life, like having your, your small bag of dices with all your favorite dice and be able to save them, export them to your different worlds, um, and just have your unique um, bag of dice. That's a really cool idea. I like the I like the possibility of being able to swap in, you know. Uh, well, I really like this particular D20. It's, it's served me well, and I've had good luck with it. But uh, I, I don't like this particular D10, so I'm going to switch it to one that has a different texture in the hopes of getting yeah. better luck. Yeah. <laughs> GW, am I going to get a dice so not so nice uh, where I can throw my dice in 3D dice jail and just, you know, nope, you, you're not let out. There, there is something with um, Foundry uh, members and uh, dice jail because I think that Nat uh, sent me a, a message like one month ago asking for a jail system. <laughs> something is going on. Do you have uh, issues with, uh, with your dice? I, have well, I need dice luck. like what Matt has, apparently. He's uh, rolling 20 <laughs> after 20. Yeah, <laughs> strange, right? <laughs> By the way, thanks, Matt, for uh, continuously uh, sending dice for the last uh, 20 minutes. <laughs> well, before so, we send the dice off and talk about Foundry Hub, oh, sorry, yeah, Foundry Hub, is there anything else you want to talk about? Uh, dice so nice, Rollsmith? Um... Well, um, what, what? Yeah, I mean, we are doing uh, uh, a lot of stuff uh, on the Dyson Ice side. I'm also always looking for people wanting to create new uh, skins. Uh, you do not need to be a 3D artist to create new appearances. Uh, you can expand on the uh, on the uh, possibilities uh, with just some. Um, uh, skills in Photoshop, for example, 
Uh, Matt, if you can hear me, and if you try to roll the uh, Spectrum dice set, that is one of the um, core um, uh, pr uh, fa face presets that is available in Dyson Ice. Um, you will see that uh, it's very nice, and uh, it's not custom um, models. Oh, yeah, sorry, you have to select. Well, it's okay, but you, you can make them black, just not have the yellow edges. But yeah, as you can see uh, here, is just um, what is possible with just images that you put on the face of the dice. So yeah, we are always looking for people um, that would like to expand on the possibilities. And um, on the Rollsmith side, um, we are working on some of our cool stuff, uh, some that I can't talk about and some that are available right now. For example, we helped to create um, some custom dice for a new um, Facebook gaming show that is called The Maze on Planet 7 that is running uh, since uh, June 1st, I believe, uh, which is a D&D uh, show uh, with um, Satin Phoenix as a GM and uh, a cool uh, a cool cast of people. Um, yeah, so you can, you can check our work there too. Very cool. Awesome. So in addition to all the stuff you've done with Rollsmith, the work you've contributed to Dice So Nice, you're also the, the mind that created and launched Foundry Hub, which is our first fan-run uh, kind of gaming news site for, for Foundry. Now I know that you're not uh, you're not the only person on on staff there. Can you tell us a bit about who contributes? Yeah, um, so Foundry Hub, um, I created the website technically, uh, but I would never been able to run it myself uh, alone. So um, I'm working with a lot of uh, very talented people that are working on the editorial side to create news. I'm working with people that moderate the forum or uh, help us with the design of the website. Um, so yeah, we have, um, I, I, I'm not sure that I, I will be able to uh, uh, give all the names that are working on, on Foundry Hub, but um, I want to give a huge shout out to everybody working there. Um, I'm. I, I want to highlight at, at, at least some of them, like uh, BRK, who is, who is the um, uh, chief of uh, the editorial team that is doing so so much work. In I, I don't understand how he can do it. By the way, if you can help me, help him, please, please come. He needs help. He refuse to say so, but he really needs help. He needs to sleep sometimes. Um, so. <laughs> If you have any skills, uh, or if you want, just want to contribute to, um, you know, something related to Foundry that is not development or is not art, uh, you don't, you not, you do not need to to be able to do any of this stuff to to help on Foundry Hub. Um, so yeah, uh, so BRK is uh, is one of the big figure behind Foundry Hub right now, um, and we have uh, yeah so many people working on the on the articles uh, and on the on the forum a anybody can submit an article to foundry hub but um, we do n we never publish publish them like right away we do a lot of work behind the scene to uh, proofread them correct them um, do the layout of the articles create the cover images uh, it's it's a lot of work uh, and uh, yeah we could really, really use uh, some help to be able to produce more content because we do not like ideas. We just like sometimes to be able to do everything we want. Um, so yeah. Uh, Matt has Foundry it's, Hub it's on a team right now. Um, do you, for those who haven't used Foundry Hub before, like what would you describe it to them as? Okay, so the idea behind Foundry Hub uh, when I created it uh, was to have a single place where um, new users or um, hardcore users uh, either way could go to find what they need if they do not if they do not know where to find it. Uh, that was the 
the primary ID. Um, so that's why there is news, keep you informed without having to check every 24 hours the, red, the subreddits or to follow the discords all day. Um, we have um, Package Explorer uh, that is on screen right now that lets you search for um, modules and systems with a um, very powerful um, search engine that can do a lot of uh, uh, things that, like tags and uh, uh, search terms um, and uh, yeah, just uh, compatibilities with your um, version. So right now you can use it to check that uh, every module that, that are tagged for uh, Open8, for example. Um, so yeah, that was the second big thing. Um, we have um, Creators Brothers so far um, to have a single point where anyone working to create amazing content for Foundry could be listed if they want to. Um, so if you are not already aware of their existence, uh, you can go there, browse um, their, their pages, see what you like and join their Patreon or join their uh, social media and things like that. Uh, and the last thing is we have um, message for the forum that is currently not completely active. I think it lacks a bit of, um, you know, like I'd say, like a kickstart uh, to to get running. Um, because, well, as a matter of fact, the most hardcore users of Foundry are also uh, much more connected uh, in real time, so through um, Discord. So it's a bit of a mismatch right now between um, the more casual users that need to have a, a more uh, chill way to, to talk and the communities that just want to, uh, to, to be live uh, all day, every day on Discord. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, all the... Oh, sorry, and we have the new features um, uh, that got released um, some days ago, well, uh, YouTube creators can now list uh, um, videos so you can find their content uh, on Foundry app that will redirect you to their uh, YouTube channels. Very cool. That, that is absolutely awesome. I think I think we need to work with you guys and see if we can get a bit more of a boost into the uh, into the forums, get more people talking on there, because personally, we, we regularly hear uh, questions feature requests uh looking for you know more of an active looking for group approach than what the discord offers um and i think foundry hub can definitely supply that i know you guys already have a looking for group forum so getting more people making use of that would probably be you know beneficial for everyone yeah yeah i think that's uh yeah i agree that's my hope too um as you say i've got a lot of uh, request for a forum so here it is uh no we just need people to animate it uh <laughs> to, to make it uh, uh yeah to make it appealing to to new users so the you've mentioned that the forum you wish you know is a feature you've had that more people should use uh, you, a new feature you just had it is youtube you know spotlights and such do you have any other new features that are in the works that you'd like to talk about uh, new features, I'm not sure. Um, however, I done a pretty bad job to advertise the hidden possibilities, I would say, of Foundry Hub that are not very much visible if you do not dig enough in the website. Uh, and I have some plans to make them more visible. Um, but, you know, small things like when you search something on Foundry Hub, it will automatically uh, search on the Foundry Wiki. So even though we do not um, let you access, we, we do not provide guides uh, as per se, you know, we are not um, uh, a, a database for developers or things like that. But um, when you search something on Foundry Hub, either if it's a module, an article, uh, or something that is available on the Foundry Wiki, it will show up in the search engine. Um, and you can use 
your browser, if you, if you bookmark Foundry, um, you can use it as the um, um, search, search engine in your in your browser. Uh, it's a functionality that is not very known by people. That but if you type the name of um, of your um, bookmark in your search bar, uh, you can search directly from your uh, from your address bar in your browser. So, so some you know some small neat thing like that that are not very visible um, that I want to promote. One thing I really like about Foundry Hub, um, Matt, if you could pull up like Moulinet uh, server, is that since you have not you know the package viewer and the articles and the creators and things like that, you can provide a really rich view uh, as you're reading about Moulinet, for instance, it uh, shows you related modules at the bottom. Um, you know, it's showing, you know, so you can go check out those packages that were just being talked about. And I think that's a really cool and cohesive platform. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's called Foundry Hub. <laughs> that's the idea behind it, just to to be this place where everything can be found. Not necessarily where everything is created. Uh, our goal is not to be, uh, or, yeah, it's not our goal. Uh, to to be where we are um, necessarily having the content or having the um, the creation happening, um, we are very much happy when uh, some of the features that we want to provide are created um, in a better way in a module or on another um, site. Um, so Foundry Hub. I, I, at its core is just here to promote the work of every member of the community that is trying to do something for the user of Foundry. For sure. And I mean, you guys are really quick at turning out articles. I, I've been really impressed when we drop a update for Foundry and you guys have a recap of what the update includes sometimes an hour after we post uh, the actual patch notes, you guys have the actual article summarizing what changed. Yeah, well, I want to thank uh, you, by the way, Nat and all the Foundry team for working with us day-to-day uh, uh, -to, -day to provide us with some insight that let us uh, be ready when something drops. Uh, so, um, Atropos, Nat, and everyone at Foundry have been very, very uh, positive toward Foundry Hub, helping us to promote this website and the things that it tries to do. Um, so yeah, thank you. Well, thank you for doing it, honestly. We're, uh, we're always glad to see the community growing in all these awesome ways and Foundry Hub, you know, being the first fan site for Foundry, we of course wanted to do everything we can to, you know, make it, make it more visible to help it grow. So I think we'll probably start taking questions from the community here. Uh, if anyone in, uh, in Twitch chat has any questions for JDW uh, regarding all of the awesome work that he's been doing, we're, uh, we're of course super glad to hear them. While we get those questions rolling in, why don't I just throw you a quick one, which is uh, totally lost on my screen. That's that's absolutely helpful. Very professional. Um, is there anything else you want to talk about Foundry Hub uh, before we wrap up that segment while he looks for that? Um, yeah, I just want to repeat my, my call for volunteers to, to join us. Uh, is there on the just writing articles, news, uh, guides, um, uh, being there to, to... I've seen people requesting a dark mode uh, for Foundry Hub. Well, uh, please, <laughs> please come and, and do it. I uh, would love to have some help uh, on the design stuff too. Um, so yeah, um, that's an opportunity for people that would like to participate in the Foundry community, but do not have the uh, background to 
be a developer or so, uh, anything if technical. If someone wants to do so, you know, write articles, make a dark mode example, how how would they do that? How Do they reach out to you on Discord? Is there a section on the Foundry Hub where they can find out more? Yeah, uh, I mean, obviously the easiest way is to contact us, contact us on Foundry Hub on the forum, but we also have a Discord channel set up um, the official um, Foundry uh, server. So you can find us at hashtag Foundry. Uh, yeah, I think it's Foundry Hub. Just, yeah. <laughs> you can find us in the community content uh, category. Very cool. Um, all right, so we have some of well, the first question coming in. Kesef asks, is it possible to have dice such as a D100 um, and dice so nice? Or is that something, you know, our customized, you know... Um, oh, you mean like 100 sizes? faces, not, uh, mm. not the usual. Um, and so, um, 100, no. <laughs> um, there is more, uh, there are more models coming up. Um, I can't say soon because it's a pain to add. It's really complicated to add uh, these kind of things. It takes a lot of time. Um, we are adding um, D, uh, D14, D16, and D24, and D30, I think if I oh, can recall cool. correctly. Um, it was, um, the models were offered to us by a member of the, I think from the DCC community. Um, but yeah, it's taking me so much time to, to add because of mm -hmm. how the optimization I've done to make it um, work well uh, is done. You just have to to do from my um, from the math I did, I think I have like one one thousand um, combination of faces that I need to calculate uh, oh by boy. hand to to integrate. By hand, uh, yeah, yeah, by hand. I I'm I just have like a three D view of my dice and I'm turning it with my mouse on the screen to find a corresponding face uh, it's an error i've contacted so many um uh mathematic genius some uh, servers on discord or on forums to get help uh, to make it automated and everybody was like yeah do it by hand it will be faster uh, oh, so wow. um, yeah so yeah you know it's coming but uh soon yeah, yeah, take your time on that. Um, <laughs> I think a D100 would be mostly round anyway. Yes, uh, I mean, 100, I, obviously, I'm not going to do it manually for the rotation things. Um, but anyway, it would, it would probably not work well with the physics en engine. Um, yeah, it's too, too, too many faces um, for low-end computers. You know, that's a thing that I have to think a lot. I didn't talk about it earlier, but one of the a lot of the time uh, that we spend on working on the Rollsmith models are uh, making them really, really um, performance. Uh, mm -hmm. We optimize them a lot, uh, either on the um, uh, FPS side or just the loading size. A full die set right now is around five megabytes. Uh, so it's pretty low for 3D models with textures on top. Um, and yeah, but yeah, performances is my bread and butter when I work on Dyson Ice. I, I, I've, I've seen every day people saying that, oh, you know, Dyson Ice is it's TV on the on your computer. It's not something that you should activate if you have a low end computer, which which is true. Yes, of course. but. To be honest, I don't want to brag, but maybe it's Foundry itself taking most of your GPU. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I remember some of the early Sorry. phases <laughs> of, you know, you're like, oh, this week I, I've got it three times faster. Oh, this week I have it two times faster. Oh, this week it's five times faster and loads, you know, smaller. Nowadays, like on, on a regular modern computer, like you can throw hundreds of dice and it oh, doesn't yeah. pause. No, no, no. It's really just for low-end computers. 
same for Foundry, right? When I say mm -hmm. it's taking most of your GPU, it's not taking a lot. It's taking so little, but obviously when you had that, uh, which, when you had a, a 3D engine on top of a 2D mm -hmm. engine that is already taking a hit on your computers, yes, it lags. And, but... and 08 shipped with no canvas mode, so if you have one of these, you know, devices that are very low power or you're running a game that doesn't really need the canvas or you're just connecting for your character sheet and playing, you know, on a different device, um, does Dice so nice run on no canvas mode or? No, I mean, uh, it could, but uh, my, uh, yeah, my idea was like, if you are actually running no canvases, you probably don't want to have really yeah, Dice running your, <laughs> your hardware. Yeah. I think, and this is just me talking completely speculative, but I think it would be very useful to have it as an option uh, to toggle on for no canvas mode so that even people who are just looking to play no canvas can still get the 3D models of the dice. Because, I mean, as yeah, you yeah. say, it's 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 pretty performant. So if you're someone who doesn't really want to run in canvas mode and, and can't your computer can't handle the full foundry experience, at least you still get some 3D experience out of it yeah. with the dice, you know? Uh, by the way, I, uh, I if, you, if any of... Uh, the users watching us right now want to suggest any feature for Dyson Ice, uh, please feel free to uh, uh, open our GitLab. It is available. Uh, um, basically, any, we, you should just type Dyson Ice on Google. Uh, and uh, to, to yeah, shoot us a feature request. Uh, we are very uh, active on it and uh, we are trying to please as much uh, users as we can. And uh, yeah, same thing for Rollsmith. If you have dice ideas, uh, dice suggestions that you would like to see us do, you can hop on our Discord server that is available on our website. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, shoot us your ideas. Um, the same user asks, um, is it possible or will it be possible to resize dice? For example, rolling very little itty bitty dice or really big dice. Okay, so... Uh, I mean, depends on what you mean by that. Like, you can uh, select the size of the dice on your screen for all the dice, you know, not just one. Uh, this is an option under your preferences tab. Uh, you can disable the auto scale system and just select the size you want. Uh, I like to put my mine at 100% uh, because. Yeah. Um, but uh, as for having different sized dice in a single roll, um, yeah, yeah, it, it should be possible technically, but uh, yeah, write a feature request. So one of the questions that came in was uh, regarding cards. Cody, did you ask that one while I was away? I did not. So we, you, you kind of alluded to it jokingly earlier, but uh, this user asked, with card support potentially coming in, would you be interested in making a 3D card system for displaying hands? Yeah, uh, I mean, <laughs> obviously it's a bit early to say because uh, I don't think even Atropos knows what it will look like. I mean, Cody, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's not uh, something that has been decided yet. So it will depend on what the features um, in the core will look like. Um, if there is a place uh, to, to have some cool cards flying on the screen with some nice uh, lights uh, reflecting on the, you know, I, I'm thinking like Hearthstone or, uh, or other uh, cool um, uh, cards, uh, card game like that. Yeah, um, yeah, that's something that I'm thinking about, but it's way too soon to decide anything. I think cards are likely going to be a, our Patreon winner. We'll visit that poll uh, towards the end of the episode. Probably just a couple of minutes, actually. Okay, any last minute questions that anyone wants to throw at uh, at JDW I see, regarding? I see more ones from Flo Rad, um, who is definitely just memeing us. Uh, the other was, um, will there be an option to save combinations that users make of their customization? For instance, maybe they set up a very wonderful bright lime green, you know, color with, you know, neon, orange edges. Maybe they want to save and share it. 
Um, I'm so sorry. I think I got the question and I'm not sure. Can you just repeat the yeah, beginning? Sorry. Um, when a user customizes a regular dice, is yeah. there, would, do you envision a path to saving that and sharing that combination? Yeah, uh, that's one of the features that will be a part of uh, the dice bag. Uh, I've been talking earlier about uh, the fact that you can select a different appearance for each of your dice. Um, obviously, it will, will make these features really, really useful, even more than right now. So it will be a part of these updates. Which probably would be will be in uh, I don't know a month or so from now. All right, um, Nath, do you want to ask Paul Rad's questions? Sure. Um, so, uh, Flo Rad asks: Since we already have memeish particle effects, can we have the COD hit marker as an option, or better yet, exploding dice that actually explode? Um, shoot us a feature request and uh, we'll see. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, you know, uh, by the way, I think it's a perfect occasion to let people know that the horrendous um, Tormund, the train that you can roll in Dyson Ice, uh, has been requested by Nat himself, so you can blame him if you uh, got scared to death uh, when someone rolled uh, the special effect. Um, I um I I don't know what you're talking about. Mm, Wasn't yeah. me. No. Okay. Sorry. Got confused. Uh, Deep play mass. Is there a guide on how to make your own custom dice skins? I know there is. Um, do you want to talk about like the API yeah. documentation you have? Yes. Uh, if you go on our GitLab or Dice and Ice, you have a wiki section on the left sidebar um, that you can click on and we have a full documentation either for system developers, for users uh, that want to create macros uh, or for artists that want to create new um, die sets. Also, you can contact me on Discord at any time, just DM me and I will be pleased to help you to create your, your own system, uh, your own face, sorry, um, either for creating a module for yourself or to integrate them into Dyson Ice. Cool. Well, I, I think that kind of concludes the uh, the guest portion. Thank you for joining us, JDW. It's been absolutely fantastic to hear about Rollsmith and all the great things you're doing there, as well as what's going on with Foundry Hub and the direction everything's going. Uh, you're our second guest, and it's been awesome having you here. Uh, anything you want to say to the people before you take off? Uh, well, first, thank you uh, once again for the invita invitation. And... Uh... Um, you welcome everybody for my absolutely fantastic accent. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it uh, through this segment. Uh, and uh, yeah, happy rolling. It's been a pleasure, Matt. Right, I think we are, are down to just us now. Uh, perfect. So... Cody, do you want to tell the the fine folks out there some of the things that uh, that we've seen over the last month that perhaps we should uh, we should share? Yeah, um, I know there's a number of premium exclusive content that we should talk about, but personally, I've been very excited one to see that Token Mold is now 08 ready. Token Mold is a really nice workflow enhancement for me because. You know, when you're targeting an enemy, it's not just Goblin 1, Goblin 2, which even then you normally have to add that in yourself. I use the adjectives feature of it, so it's Angry Goblin 1, and it, or sometimes I skip the 1, and it's, you know, it's Diminutive Goblin. Uh, it adds a little bit more flavor to, you know, a group of enemies. It makes it clear when the players want to, you know, target an enemy, which one they're talking about. Um, outside of that, I've recently become a big fan of Next Up. It's a something that automatically opens and closes sheets for a GM, and oh, I think can also do so for players. Um, so you know, you hit next turn, and it opens up you know that goblin sheet, and then closes it right away. Um, finally, Dungeon Channel has released a very cool tool I haven't had a chance to learn yet because it's mostly focused on map creators and not GMs. But if you take a normal map and then you export it as like a black and white image, it will automatically wall the differences. 
and it's they have a, a video showing off how it works and it's super cool i hope more creators take advantage of you know what they're offering so they can quickly wall I'm trying to think of the uh, the modules that have caught my eye most recently, but I've been a bit overrun in the uh, in the past couple of weeks, so I've missed a lot of really cool stuff that's come out in the uh, in the release announcements channel. I should take a moment and have a look. In the uh, in the meantime, uh, I will talk about briefly the. Uh, just straight up awesome content that we've seen released in the last month. We've seen a bunch of premium content packs, including a new system, Torg Eternity. Uh, we've seen premium content packs for uh, the Dark Eye 5th edition, including a lot of uh, content in German, but also some in English. Uh, we've seen free content packs in uh, the... Boy King of Idaho released a audio pack, as well as Tabletop Music Bazaar's free album, uh, Kingdoms and Conquerors, I think. Um, we've also seen premium content from Cubicle 7 for Warhammer uh, Fantasy Roleplay, including Middenheim City uh, and Archives of the Empire. Um, all, of course, going to be available in 08. X as soon as Mooman finishes the update process for Warhammer 4, uh, sorry, 4E, not 4K. Uh, 40K? 40K. 40K anyway. is that uh, same, you know, people. Yeah, Sa same people, different, uh, different universe. Um, in addition, we also saw a couple of really cool content releases with uh, Rugalt's Dragon Shorn Tales, uh, Last Death. Last Deaths of Summer premium content pack, as well as the free adventure uh, Titan's Goblin, which is available for both 5th and 3.5 editions. Yeah, Rook uh, Rookhold's content um, is cool in that it targets both versions of 5e. And for those who didn't know, Rookhold is actually the system developer behind 3.5e himself. Um, and I always see him around in the community. Yeah, Rookhold's a uh, forced to be reckoned with as a developer he's very very active uh lastly i i just want to give two quick shout outs to um heliana's guide to monster hunting which is a uh, kickstarter that launched but as part of it they decided to throw out a uh, a free adventure for fifth edition and this of course comes from the awesome humperdink humperdink's wares uh, that I got to work with Humperdinck to ensure that it, uh, it it met, you know, the standards for Foundry's free content. Uh, and in the next uh, week or so, we're going to be launching a part a, uh, a free content pack from Angela's Maps, which some of you may be familiar with. I see well, a question in chat about probably the noise in the background. I have an African gray parrot in another room who uh, is screaming as though he is being murdered. That's uh, that's just what he does sometimes. Um, in case you missed the other content that's been out for Anniversary Weekend and such, you can catch our very own Matt uh, currently behind the scenes running the stream, as well as the wonderful Andrew at Tropos. As GM, they did the first part of the Demon Queen's Awaken, an original uh, D and D one, two shot, maybe three shot. Let's be real. Um, that was run as part of uh, Anniversary Weekend, along with some excellent community members. We got Amy from Sigil. We got um, DM Dave. We've got uh, Caligo from the League. Um, that just went up. All of these staff were involved in either planning it or playing it. So it was kind of, you know, it's not all of us playing together, but it was, you know, it was a still a staff effort, uh, which was a lot of fun to, you know, help plan out these new encounters and such. Um, that's a four hour long, uh, thing. A lot, a lot of people caught it live. It was a lot of fun to watch myself. Um, and, you know, hopefully in part two is where we see Matt's head just kind of roll off his body and, you know, on the floor. But we'll see. You, you wish a lot of harm on our poor, our poor, uh, director. That's, 
Uh, you're right. I do sure. need him for that next episode, don't I? All right. Yeah, I think I think you might need to see someone. You, you're you're concerning. Matt's my favorite Oreo. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, so, um, I think we'll open the floor now, get some community questions. I noticed that someone asked about adding more payment options in the future. Uh, we're pretty happy with our payment options currently over at foundryvtt.com. Um, Stripe has been really useful. I know that the SEPA workflow isn't great for everybody, but, uh, it's, it's better to have SEPA as an option than have no option for those who wish to pay with debit. Um, we often get the question, you know, are we going to allow PayPal? Uh, we'd have to implement an entirely separate payment workflow, and I don't think that is on the agenda. Certainly not in the near future, probably not in the long term either. Uh, so those of you holding up for PayPal support, if Stripe supports it, we'll support it. But uh, I don't think we're going further that way. Uh, we'll, of course, open the floor for questions. If you have any questions, please get them to us, and we will absolutely address them. Um, Flowrad is asking if there's plans for a general marketplace, maybe with an option for smaller creators to self-publish. That, uh, that sounds like one you might have some insight on. Oh, no. Uh, as always, we have lots of plans. In fact, we have so many plans. I feel very comfortable in working here for the next decade, two, three. Um, we are starting to think a little more about that topic. Um, you know, we want we're balancing, you know, website updates right now. And, you know, seeing that we've grown to so many packages and such, you know, looking at some performance improvements and such. Um, you know, the community was so excited about 086 that it, you know, gave us like a week long hug of death that we've slowly been fighting. Um, now is a great time to start. Um, one of the upcoming features that we have committed to is Patreon auth. So content creators will be able to put out, you know, Patreon packages and users will only be able to install or update them if they're current active Patreons, hopefully even at a certain membership, but haven't. Like, there's some stuff to figure out. Um, we're probably going to stop there and then, you know, look, you know, at what to do next. It'd be it work on 09 or work on, you know, maybe expanding even further how we can, you know, make the website, you know, better. Or, you know, maybe it's a new package search. Maybe it's, you know, enhanced workflows for, you know, our, our stuff. Maybe it is starting to look at a marketplace. But I am promising nothing. So, Atro, you know, you can't, you can't yell at me. Uh, he can yell at me. Uh, I'm, I'm promising that at some point in the future, we will definitely communicate further about this topic. Oh, that's so. Uh, ooh, I'm going to hold you to that. Uh, realistically speaking, in addition to Patreon off, which uh, Cody just spoiler dropped, uh, we... It's announced! I think. Shh. Go. Let, let right. me make you out to be the devil. It's... I've, I've got to do something here to ruin your reputation. Um, with regard to additional marketplace development, it's been an internal conversation for a long time uh, about whether or not, you know, a marketplace is the right approach for Foundry. We're not, we're not on one side of the fence on that or another yet, um, but I think there is probably a, a future where some sort of marketplace exists. The question is, more of a when rather than an if. Uh, but as with everything, it's a matter of prioritization. How do you decide what to focus on with regard to marketplace development? Because I'll, I'll be straight up honest, it, it isn't really an internal drive for us to want to sell other people's products. We think that people should be able to sell their own products and we'll help them and work with them as best we can. That being said, we also see requests regularly for some sort of content creation marketplace to, to make it easier to sell your products on Foundry. So we're not, we're not deaf to those, and we definitely want to handle it the right way. It's something that I think handling poorly would be worse than not doing. 
Yeah. As it currently stands, you know, Rollsmith was completely able to launch and, you know, sell foundry specific uh, stuff without, you know, our any without us having something in place. And I think that's really cool and important. Other platforms, you got to go through them here. As long, you know, as long as you get a manifest link, you're generally pretty good. So uh, why don't we throw the uh, Patreon poll up on the screen if Matt's, uh, Matt's with us currently, and we can talk about the uh, currently resolving Patreon poll briefly while more questions come in. So for those of you out there who are Patreon subscribers, you're probably aware of this already. For those of you who are not, we actually have a prioritization vote going currently, uh, which is... Uh, working to decide what options we are going to focus as the primary part of 09 development. Uh, obviously, we want to make sure that we, we stress here, this isn't a whether or not these features will be implemented poll. This is a what order will these features be implemented in poll. So... Currently, the uh, the leader is card decks and hands, which I'm both excited about and terrified of because it will mean having to redo my uh, my very custom card based game system that will one day say an official release. Uh, once more, I'm now on revision number three of the entire system. Uh, but being able to use an official card method as opposed to what I've got, which is a currently hacked together, absolutely spaghetti code mess, uh, would probably be much more desirable. Um, for those of you who are interested, we have a nine poll option uh, covering everything from simple fog of war through advanced measured templates it's it's very comprehensive if you are not currently a patron and you want to vote you still have time you can subscribe vote now if you're just interested in the results we will be releasing the poll to the public once we uh once it concludes unfortunately patreon just doesn't have the support to have the poll visible but only voted in by patrons um, and if you would like to be involved in the poll uh, of any, all of our tiers, starting at $3 a month, uh, I give access to vote and it runs for six more days. So, uh, any other questions that came in from the community? Uh, is there a plan to integrate more automation inside core so that they could be accessed from all systems, such as applying damage and uh, resolving dice rolls. Well, Cody can probably speak more to this as a coding question, but I personally feel like there's an awful lot of automation that could be done using the existing API. Um, I think as it currently stands, there's a lot of built-in things that maybe people don't know about or you know haven't leveraged themselves. Uh, 5e and simple world building are both kind of living API docu you know examples of how to use things in foundry um, for instance until I went looking I didn't know that there's actually already a way to apply damage um, automatically using um, the targeting API to know who you want to do or the select API you know say apply to this or you know to this target and the context menu drop downs you can in 5e, and this is something I you know, did myself in my system, you know, right click a damage die and hit apply as damage. And I went ahead and customized it with, you know, apply as double damage, you know, apply as healing instead, apply as temporary health. Because Foundry ultimately provides the framework, but it's up to the system dev to fit it into their system. Um, it wouldn't make sense for everything to do apply damage the same way. My system has temporary health, and that means you subtract from it first and then the main health. Which is just, that's not possible to abstract, you know, across everything. So providing these tools and frameworks and then laying system developers and module developers glue them together is our preferred way of doing it. Now we do hope to continuously improve on, you know, knowledge distillation and, you know, 
videos and documentation and knowledge based articles that help people learn these things and get better at building these things. Um, and that's something we're always working with the league and expanding on and we love all their efforts as well, you know, of doing so. For sure. And of course, for those unaware, what you do is what I did, which is make friends with a bunch of these developers who have crazy good insight and then just pester them at all hours of the day with the most crazy questions like, what the hell is an array? And uh, eventually they'll, uh, they'll tell you to go away and you'll learn JavaScript by going and doing a course like you should have done to begin with. Uh, we do have a development basics channel in the league, which is a great place for people to stop by if they're starting literally learning JavaScript for the first time or learning how to develop for the first time. I should go back and sanitize the logs of my early conversations with Moo Man when he was helping me write my system for the first time and release them to the public as a living document of me losing my mind over the course of six weeks learning JavaScript the wrong way. Question for Cody. Cat in background. Cat. Cat. There, there, there is cat. no cat. Also, that's not a question. Her name's Princess. Cats in general? Yes. Cats. Also moose. Mostly cats. Any other questions from the community about uh, software-related stuff? Stuff about Foundry Virtual Tabletop, what it was like going through Anniversary Week, that sort of thing. You know, that, that sort of work-related questions. Let's go. I, I keep thinking just more cat questions. It's it's all about your cat. You're gonna have to start closing the door when we're doing these. Cats are the the cat's a distraction. Now, how did we decide on the name of the show? Well, uh, I I talked to Cody very briefly. We both proposed names neither of us liked, and then I turned around and messaged my good friend Cobalt, who you may recognize as another Foundry staff member, who is just a fountain of ideas for ridiculous names for projects, and said, I need 10 possible names for a Foundry-related live stream, uh, wherein Cody and I are going to make an ass of ourselves to the general populace and talk about uh, what it is we do. And he asked a couple of pertinent questions and then turned out a list of like 30 names and I picked four of those and handed them to Cody and he came back and we both agreed that hammering it out was the one to go with. You know, when you pose it like that, it really is a wonder that Atro uh, greenlit this project. Well, see... There's what I say to Cobalt and what I say to you, which is informal and not necessarily at all professional. And then there's uh, how we pose it to the boss, which was much more along the lines of... Much more along the lines of... I hear muted. Sorry, there was some background noise that I needed to deal with. Okay. Um... So, uh, yes, uh, the way we posed it to the boss, which was much more along the lines of, we're going to have a discussion of kind of news of the month, things about Foundry, we're going to get some guests on from the community to showcase their work, that kind of thing. And admittedly, it is more of a professional approach than, uh, than I make it seem, I hope. Um, SF and... asks... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Tessaf asks, do llamas spit on people when angry? I assume he means alpacas, which are the animals you uh, assist in carekeeping. Uh, yes and yes. In both cases, llamas and alpacas do in fact spit on people uh, if you are dumb enough to cross them. So generally you want to be polite to them and then they won't spit on you. Uh, I noticed that there were there was a question back there about the next major feature proposals for Foundry. So we've got a few that are on the Patreon poll. We've also got some internally that we, uh, you know, have slated as possibles for upcoming in 09. 
Um, I'm not sure if you're referring specifically to the ones on the Patreon poll or ones that we may not be able to disclose. So for the Patreon poll, I think you can probably check them out uh, if you're a patron. If not, uh, I'll pull up a short list here real quick and we can discuss them. Or I would, except patron. Patreon does not want to let me log in currently. I, uh... what I tell you. Cody, take another question while I do this. Oh, right. Uh, let's see. Yes, we did hammer it out. Um, I, what's the right way to learn JavaScript for Foundry? Uh, boy, that's a big one. Um, I would recommend just start playing around in Foundry. Take a look at macros. Macros are the same, using the same API as everything else, but they're very small, you know, in general and tend to, you know, you can click and run. You know, start, you know, just messing around, you know, make something pop on screen, you know, change, uh, make your macro, you know, move an actor around. As you start, you know, as you just grow from there and learn things, you can start making a module, you know, learn how, the, that's set up, learn how the folders are structured, learn how you can, you know, actually give your module a name and, you know, where it's installed from and get those macros in that module. Then start doing things like hooking into our the hooks API so that when a new chat message comes and you turn it bright purple, you know, don't focus too much on making something useful at first. Just go ahead and start, you know, poking around and learning. Um, you'll make a lot of mistakes. You'll learn a lot of things. You'll, you know, take advantage of the great community that's out there, both in the main Foundry Discord developer channel, as well as the League of Extraordinary Developers. Uh, you know, the only way you get extraordinary is by starting and get, going down that path. So I'll add on to that and say, as the probably least experienced person for development on the Foundry staff, um, the way I did it as a total amateur and the, the way I recommend doing it for other people now are two different things. When I initially got started, I joined the Foundry server, walked in and went, hey, so I want to create my game system, which is a custom game. Uh, how do I do that? And a very nice gentleman by the name of Moo Man took me under his wing and <laughs> proceeded to hold my hand through six weeks of me screaming about JavaScript until I had a functional system I could run for my players while I was running stuff through uh, simple world building. The correct way and the way that I'd recommend now, at least I feel, as a total amateur, no coding experience really other than Foundry related, have an idea of what you want the end product to be. Keep it simple so that you can judge if you've accomplished that and work towards it inside Foundry while you do a very simple introduction to JavaScript course from somewhere like Free Code Camp or um, it's the one I used, Code Academy, offer both offer very nice introductory courses for JavaScript free. It takes like six, 12 hours tops you can do it in a sitting if you're crazy and the introductory level is really all you need to get started in Foundry for any of the simple stuff like creating a system or making a very basic module. It will get you where you're going. In addition, communicate with people in the development channels on Discord and on the League Discord to ask your dumb questions like I ask where you start with, I want to do this thing, how do I do this thing? And then they, and then they proceed to dissect your question for you. Um, having that information and that access is really super important. Uh, you're not going to be able to just pick up Foundry and go, I want to JavaScript and have it happen. You need, to, you need the information, you need the help. If we had unlimited time and effort and abilities and money and all these things what i would love is for us to have a big e-learning website where you you know with 
created content te te going through, you know, you pick a course and you're like JavaScript 101, you know, Hooks API, you know, 202 and such, and start earning badges and all this stuff, you know, Salesforce style, and going down a big e-learning, you know, path to slowly, you know, pick up all the things. And then, you know, at the end, hopefully you are a foundry capable developer who's learned every piece along the way of how to do it. That, um, the only thing I've ever seen do that well is Salesforce, and Salesforce is like the world's largest uh, CRM, and so I don't think we are um, going to get there anytime. anytime that, sound, but. that sounds like a nightmare to me as someone who would be required to write the content for it. Uh, so let's let's not do that. It's a but great idea. Cool. Terrible it idea. Just great idea. Terrible existence. idea. Um, right, so back to the question on uh, what is in the pipeline. So discussed future features for Foundry include advanced measure templates, which uh, improve how measured templates work to bring in template animations, things like that, uh, additional damage types, um, ability to attach a measured template to a token so it can be rendered as an aura, that kind of thing. Um, advanced wall types which would be you know curved walls uh kind of you know all the, all the fun stuff that you can think of uh ability to reduce the count of wall objects in a scene by uh either some algorithm that does it or something like that um and maybe a few new types of walls who knows uh, curved decks and hands, which is the current leading uh, vote in the Patreon poll. Event triggers, which is second place, uh, which would be things like, um, I think card decks and hands are probably self-explanatory, so I kind of skimmed that one. And um, uh, event triggers would be stuff like you move a token, it triggers a trap, the game pauses and notifies your players the trap has been sprung and what happens, that kind of thing. Um, personally, I think it's a great idea, but I think it's one that a lot of people would probably take one look at the setup for and change their mind. But, you know, I'm not going to tell people how to vote. Vote however you want. Vote for the feature you'd like. Um... Improved canvas interaction tools would bring in things like uh, pointers and, and ability to ping a position on the canvas. Some improvements like um, uh, directing, locking the screen for players to a certain view. Uh, if, if you're the kind of person that wants to control every facet of the appearance of your game, that kind of thing, like a director mode, if you will. Um, uh, Improved weather special effects would be like uh, additional weather features. I mean, we all know that built-in Foundry has some weather effects for uh, particular scenes if you want to set them, but, you know, that could always be expanded and there's always additional stuff that could be done with weather, uh, including more particle emitters and, you know, more performance gains, additional textures, more animations, uh, special effects features added to tiles in addition to other, you know, facets of the canvas. Uh, an improved journal system that would bring in, you know, kind of an overhaul of the UX UI for it, as well as more options for map notes, that kind of thing. Uh, placeable items, which would basically give you a token system, but for items instead of just actors. Uh as well as Simple Fog of War, which, while one of our most requested features, has been handled very, very well by a community module up until now. Last but not least, I'll also point out that in addition to these features, we also have a separate milestone on the Foundry GitLab called Epics, which is large features that would require a lot of work and will probably be done, but the uh, amount of effort it would require would require a new version dedicated to it. So 
if you want to know what features we have in the pipeline that we're thinking about, that might be in 09. Some of those are a good place to look. Just, again, don't try not to give me more work. I already have enough. And, and Nath, make sure of that. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We all have plenty of work to do. Um, speaking of which, we should uh, have Kim joining us sometime in the next month, I believe. So that will be uh, some uh, much appreciated uh, reinforcements. Awesome. A new person to throw under the bus anytime there's a coding issue. Ah, finally. No, I won't escape, won't I? Will I? No, you, no, you won't. No, you won't. C comes Kim. before K. Just Kim day one. It was Cody's fault. Um, so, a uh, question from Alaric. When is 1.0 and what does that even mean? What it even means is pff, anybody's guess. Um, Andrew recently commented that he will consider releasing a 1.0 when he feels the software is feature complete, which I took to mean never. Um, but uh, when is it coming? Anybody's guess? Uh, uh, I will say on that, um, not that We've even started having the discussions, but I am working on a pitch where we move away from the traditional, where, from what we have been calling the releases. People often say, you know, hey, we're not following semantic versioning. But the thing is, yeah, we're not. It just looks like semantic versioning. It's like, uh, is often confusing. So, uh, and in one of many internal discussions we're having as part of this upcoming release is, do we want to relook at that? Do we want to call it something else? Do we, you know, so there may never be a 1.0. We might not start. We might not call things that anymore. Who knows? Foundry version 09 auspicious arch archmage. When? 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 Yeah, I'll we'll never remove the when question, will it? No, no, it sure won't. Uh, so we're coming down to the end of it. I think we're probably ready to close up. Are there any last minute questions that you people might want to get in or any last minute things, Cody, that you want to talk about before we take off? I think we covered it all. I'm, uh, you know, thanks again for joining us. I love doing this. It's in, it's certainly, I wasn't expecting a software development job to end up, uh, with uh, so much you know, streaming and, you know, interviewing guests and such, but it's it's a nice change of pace and it's something I enjoy doing. Um, so I'm glad that we're able to do this and I look forward to whoever we bear around for next week, next month. Next month, next month. Don't be making promises about next week. I've got enough stuff for you to do next week. Um, so I want to thank everyone for coming out. What three words would you use to describe Edo to those who aren't tech savvy? Awesome, faster, complicated. Cody, what three audio, audio roofs better? Yeah, better foundry. That's our new release title. <laughs> oh God, don't start it. Don't start it. Uh, mobile version. I have players who want to play on the phone. Uh, we're kind of held up on semi-working mobile support through iOS. There is probably a point in the future where there is some sort of functional mobile that isn't maintained wholly by the community. In the meantime, I recommend you check out TouchVTT and Google the steps for how to turn on WebGL in the latest iOS version. It works by default in Chrome. Uh, on Android devices. Uh, oh, and mobile improvement. Yes, that's one that recently released. Also, there's the old school simple mobile from uh, Handy Fun. Uh, other than that, thank you everyone for coming and joining us for 
yet another episode of Hammering It Out. We'll be joined next month by someone. We're not sure yet, but uh, we'll be looking into it over the next uh, the next week or so. If you're uh, if you're interested in this and anything else that's Foundry related, please feel free to join our Discord server, where almost thirty five thousand people discuss Foundry on a daily basis. Uh, in addition, the uh, the League of Extraordinary Foundry Virtual Tabletop Developers yeah. is running a package jam right now. So if you are at all interested in coding or would like to pick up a module and start developing, now's the time. You can win prizes. You can check them out on their Discord server, which is linked through ours. Uh, beyond that, thank you very much for coming. It's been a pleasure. See you next month. Have a good one, everyone.